The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Um, so my name is Paul Frields. Uh, I'm the Fedora project leader. That basically means that I work for Red Hat and I serve as uh, the community go-between uh, from our many, many thousands of volunteers uh, and our engineering department and other departments at Red Hat and uh, just making sure that we have everybody coordinated and working towards, uh, towards really good goals for, uh, for open source to keep progressing forward. And uh, it's something that I started uh, doing back in February of last year. I took over from a guy by the name of Max Spivak. Uh, Max is now one of, our, uh, one of our community leaders in community on the Red Hat community architecture team. So I work very closely with him and his team to uh, make sure that we're doing everything we can to uh, empower our community to do interesting and amazing things with Fedora, and not just with Fedora, but with many of the other areas that Red Hat touches. Because of course, you know, Red Hat is very deeply involved in open source beyond just Fedora. We have a number of other upstreams that we work in. Um, we're very excited about uh, opportunities in education, in increasing transparency in government, and so on and so forth. So Fedora is just one of the elements. But uh, luckily, that's the part that that I get to do. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. First, um, you know, not to gild the lily, but I did want to say uh, a, a very special thank you to the folks at Southeast Linux Fest for having me out here, giving me the opportunity to speak, um, and frankly, putting on a hell of a conference for the first time. I'm, I was just floored and uh, really happy that I got to be here for your inaugural event, so thank you. Um, and also, oh, yeah, absolutely. And thanks to the other speakers, and um, definitely thanks to all of you for being here. Um, also, I want to give a quick thanks to anybody out there who is sharing material. And as you noticed, uh, my, uh, my presentation is Creative Commons licensed. It's uh, att uh, Attribution Sharealike 3.0, and it'll be published out where you can get to it and use it if you like. And I just wanted to give a, uh, 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 some notice to the people who provided some of the graphics that are in my, uh, my slides here. So um, I'm going to make this short. Uh, we're going to talk about Fedora in a nutshell. Um, Fedora is the community project sponsored by Red Hat. We are not a beta of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We are not a dumping ground for crazy software. Uh, we are a community-run project that turns out every six months one of the best damn Linux distributions out there. Uh, and it's chock full of goodies. And I hope that everybody will give a try uh, uh, to Fedora 11. Uh, Leonidas, which was just released, uh, and uh, I really like running a lot of different Linuxes that are out there. I've got VMs of pretty much everything that's out there, and I encourage you to do the same thing. It's a lot of fun to, to play around with other distros. Um, we are a contributor-centric community, and uh, that means that we've set our sights squarely on people who want to participate in open source. Um, we think it's wonderful that Grandma Tilly's all over the world like to use Fedora. I actually have a Grandma Tilly myself who uses Fedora. My mom uses it. My wife uses it. My two kids, age eight and five, use it. So I truly believe that uh, open source is ready for everyone to use. Um, but being contributor-centric means that those people are a byproduct of the work that we do in empowering contributors. They're a byproduct of doing good work and in increasing participation in open source. Um, and that focus is what makes Fedora important, not just for those users further down the line uh, of Fedora, but also for the users of the d distributions that are derived from Fedora. And that includes Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and that includes uh, uh, other distributions like CentOS. Is anybody here a CentOS user? Yeah, a lot of hands on it. I am too, actually. Um, I run it at home for my home server. So uh, you know, those distributions also benefit from the work we do, and that literally t is tens of millions of users out there. So what I'm going to talk to you about is what contributor-centric means, uh, why we concentrate on contributors, uh, how to do it. Uh, I'll give you some of our experiences in, in empowering contributors, and what influences that uh, produces for our project and, and what's come out of that contributor focus. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, cool. All right, so, oh, I've, I've gone backwards apparently in time, and we're going to start over again now. All right, don't hit that key. That's what that means. 
I'm lucky they give me a laptop, actually. <laughs> oh, God, not that guy. Um, so why focus on contributors? Well, um, I guess there's a, this, is, uh, this is the way I like to lead into this question, is, uh, is a, a question about the deep sea. Is anybody here scuba dive? Some scuba divers out here? So you guys are probably know very well, and, and the rest of you probably do from watching things like you know, the Discovery Channel or something like that, that what is on top of the water is broad and it has many waves, but what is much more interesting, far more interesting than what's on the surface of the water is what's underneath. Right? It's teeming with life. It's teeming with interesting stuff to get involved in. And you know, if you're a, if you're a, a diver, you can go down and see some of those, you know, some of the life and, and uh, interesting ecosystems that happen, uh, and uh, and sort of put yourself right in the middle of them. And I like to think about that as being a uh, a good rough analogy for how communities of participation work. All right, um, this picture might be a little hard to read for those of you in the back, but essentially it's a triangle, and the really wide base at the bottom is consumers, right? And they could be consumers of any type, right? They could be, this could be a picture of all the people who like using iPods or you know, all the people who drive a, you know, drive a pickup truck. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, the important thing is that the largest area of this, of this triangle are, are essentially consumers, right? Um, they'll use whatever it is, but essentially don't have a whole lot of investment in it other than that. And you know, it's obviously they're very important to keeping the, the ecosystem going. But as you move up the triangle, uh, what you find is that you start increasing the level of participation as you move to a narrower and narrower focus of people, and vice versa. So what we've discovered by reverse engineering the numbers for the communities that we work in is that roughly 80% of any given community um, are content to simply consume software, uh, which, you know, again, not a value judgment. That's, it's absolutely uh, required that you have those people because they're out there actually running things and creating real world, uh, real world cases uh, for, you to, uh, for you to solve. Um, and out of the remaining 20%, the majority do. Uh, the majority actually will get involved uh, in a participatory way, and I'll talk about some of those later. Uh, some of the um, uh, some of the ways that you might get involved in, in participation would be uh, moving from the the shallow water, the uh, the surface, uh, down to uh, down to the shallow deeps, where you start uh, editing a wiki or filing a bug. Right, the minute somebody makes the leap from being just a consumer to where they actually get involved to make something better. Even just a small step like that, it might be filing a bug, it might be giving somebody help on a mailing list. They've crossed the line from being a consumer to being a participant, right? And that is where somebody becomes very interesting to us as, uh, you know, as, a, as an open source project. Now, as you further refine that population um, and people move from things like uh, editing the wiki and filing bugs uh, to, uh, creating patches, right? Or they might actually triage bugs, right? Or they might actually manage a team, or they might write a, do a piece of documentation that's for formal publication. Um, and as you move further up that scale, you find people who actually get involved in, in the code. Uh, they actually become involved as a, as a package maintainer. They might actually maintain a software package in, in Fedora. And uh, those are our contributors. That's our, our core of contributors. And that comes to usually about 5% of that triangle. Well, so why concentrate just on that 5%? Well, if you look at just this triangle, um, so what will happen is the, the folks at the top actually become the biggest influence on everyone else around them. Right? You could think of these people as like uh, a fashionista, right? Do any, any of you have fashionista friends, people who, you know, they're very trendy, they, have, they you know, know things about clothes, and they know things about good music, stuff like that, right? And you find out all your good hints from them, and you find out, hey, that band that you love, you found out from a friend, or, uh, you know, and you keep coming back to that same friend again and again. You know, those people are sort of the movers and shakers of, of communities. Those are people who get really deeply involved. Uh, in, in, a, uh, in, in some slice of life. So if you just look at this triangle by itself, it seems like, wow, well, really, you want to look at the consumers because, I mean, that is 80% of the triangle. Unfortunately, that 80% doesn't have much influence over people who are not already in that community. The people who really have influence are the people who are contributors and participants, 
right? So those are the people that we uh, are really interested in because they are the ones who are going to influence this future user pool, which is many, many, many uh, uh, orders of magnitude larger than the community as it, as it exists right now. So in order to, to uh, go after these folks and you know, get them interested in Fedora, we, uh, we are interested in upstream communities and ecologically sound practices. What does that mean? It essentially means that when we participate in an upstream, uh, we are looking to uh, give back in a way that is going to scale out to the entire open source community. Uh, when we are... Uh, maintaining packages and we find bugs that need fixing, those patches actually go back up to the upstream community and we coordinate with them very closely. And we do that for a number of reasons. One of them is because if you maintain patches, essentially you are increasing the load on the people who maintain those packages. Now in Fedora, the vast majority of our packages, and it's well over three quarters, it might in fact be over 80% now, and we have something like 10,000 packages available for Fedora. Um, and over 80% of those packages are maintained by volunteers. So what we try and do is encourage those folks to, uh, to follow ecologically sound practices of getting those bugs moved upstream, working with the upstream community, and getting it included in the code that is later going to come not, back ju not just back to Fedora, but back to all of these distributions everywhere. Right, so I always think about that as n not strip mining the open source ecosystem, right? Because you're not just carrying a load yourself. What you also do by keeping patches in your, you know, in your package that don't go back to the upstream, uh, is that you are radically changing the uh, nature of how open source is experienced from one distribution to another. And overall, that actually really hurts open source because it makes people think that it's a very uh, it's a very chaotic landscape uh, out of which no order and no semblance of sanity is ever going to be found. And I think those of us who've worked in it for a while know that although it is an evolutionary process and there is chaos in it, ultimately out of that chaos comes order because we do forge consensus on what makes good code, right? That's the, that's the essence of many eyeballs is bringing a lot, of, uh, a lot of good minds to code and then that code gets refined and improved and eventually moved out to more people. So these practices make that, make that possible. Um, something else that's important uh, about why we concentrate on contributors is that we found that it produces measurable results. Um, and I can give you an example, measurable results, actually a couple from, from our uh, Fedora teams. Our infrastructure team, which is actually run by a fellow named Mike McGrath, who's been, uh, actually we hired him as a result of uh, his infrastructure work a couple of years ago, and he runs that team now. And essentially we have an around the world uh, mainly volunteer staff of system administrators, and they run all of our infrastructure. Everything that you see running Fedora on the back end uh, is contained in colos uh, actually in many different areas around the world. We uh, mirror from one place to another. We've got uh, complete fault tolerance. We run a lot of our services on virtualization, the same sort of stuff that you hear open source vendors trying to sell people. Um, that's what we use, and we know it works because you know, we're supporting essentially tens of thousands of people around the world every day with almost no downtime, right? When we do have downtime, it's usually planned, and we tell everybody about it in advance. So we run very much like a, you know, like a company would, only we're run by our own volunteers. Um, that infrastructure has saved us, uh, it's saved us count, countless uh, uh, dollars and uh, probably a lot of heartache. One example of the infrastructure we use is Mirror Manager, which uh, controls our mirror system around the world. That's where people download Fedora. When you download from download.fedoraproject.org or mirrors.fedoraproject.org, you get redirected to a mirror that's close to you using some uh, geographic code that figures out where is, a, where is a good site for you. Um, and by doing that, we solved a problem for Red Hat. And I'll tell you a little story about that. Back in the days of, I believe it was Fedora Core 6, uh, when we released Fedora Core 6, and that would have been in about 2006, if I remember correctly, late 2006, um, back then Red Hat was basically still providing all the infrastructure and bandwidth out of one place. And so the day that we released Fedora Core 6, um, we melted their router. 
Um, and I mean literally melted. There was, the insides were goo. Um, and that's how, it, the, it, it, we, we were at 100% capacity for I think about a, an hour and a half. And I, you know, I don't know if a cooler broke down or what, but essentially we destroyed this incredibly expensive piece of equipment they had. Um, and they weren't real happy about it. So we made it, <laughs> we made it a point. Yeah, who would have thought? Um, hang on, just hang on just a second while I sneeze out some more money. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen, let me tell you. So. Um, so what we decided to do is to come up with a system uh, that was 100% free and open source, again, run by our volunteers, which would spread this load out among many, many different sites around the world. And, uh, and we've done that. And through Mirror Manager, we're also much better able to track uh, downloads. So for example, we know that we've had in the past four or five days about a quarter million downloads, uh, direct downloads of Fedora 11 just through our Mirror Manager. Now, People are also downloading directly from sites near them, and we don't really have a good way of counting that, uh, but we do know that. And we also know that, for example, we've shipped uh, something like 60 or 70,000 more copies by BitTorrent already, which comes to some number, 100 and some terabytes of, of data in just the first few days. So all that is going out to a lot of eager people. Um, so that's an example of a measurable, uh, you know, a measurable output. Another measurable output is our community-run website. The web that actually fronts all this is run by our community. It's a, uh, it's a version-controlled, completely translatable website. Our community translators translate it into well over a dozen and a half languages. So if you're in a different region and you go to our fedoraproject.org website, you'll get a version that's translated for, uh, for your area. Um, something else that, measure, that measurable contributions provide is a link to people. Right, and there's this really ugly guy on the right, but the other guy, the handsome young fellow right there, uh, his name is Ricky Zhao, and he uh, is the lead for our websites team, uh, has been for about a year or so. And uh, Ricky came to us out of the blue and wanted to do something that was finite and measurable, and uh, he had some, uh, some background in running websites uh, at high school. So Ricky, uh, this picture was taken. Ricky was, I think, not quite yet 17, and he was going to be held, uh, he was going to be heading off to Carnegie Mellon University in the fall. So to help provide an incentive for people like Ricky, young people who want to get some job experience but you know don't have a resume built up for uh, you know maybe a, uh, a, a a large company like Red Hat, um, we provide them a way to do that, and we actually uh, established a Fedora scholarship. And Ricky was our, our first uh, recipient of that scholarship. And our second recipient of that scholarship is due to be announced, I believe, at the end of this month or beginning of July. So stay tuned for that. We'll be, uh, we'll be awarding another, uh, another helpful young person some college money. By the way, if you know somebody who is, uh, who is into earning some college money, send them our way. Um, so... The other thing that, uh, one of the other things that we try to concentrate on when it comes to uh, uh, concentrating on contributors is the way that it encourages radical transparency, what we like to think of as radical transparency. We try and make everything as open and transparent in the Fedora project as possible. And what, what that means is that the people who work in the Fedora project have a stake in the project. Right? If they can see what's going on everywhere in the project, then they know the effects that they have across the project. And it makes them feel some, some ownership and some responsibility and also a deeper affinity uh, for the project. Um, so that, that openness means that all of these building blocks that we produce are 100% free and open source software. That is the one rule in Fedora that we never ever go against. So everything that we build in Fedora, 100% free and open source software. So whether you're looking at uh, our website, our build system, our content, the, uh, the, our, the contents of our Fedora hosted.org system where we host other projects, uh, our translations, the spec files for building our packages, uh, everything from soup to nuts is 100% free and open source. We only run on free and open source platforms and so on and so forth. Now some people might call that religious. I call it good sense because it works. All right, anyone can take these building blocks as a result of their being free and open source, and they can turn them into something new. And I like to think of that as keeping us honest, right? 
if somebody decides that we are we as the Fedora project, right, whoever that we is, right, whether it's the leadership here or a specific team, whatever the case may be, if they just decide the whole project is just dead wrong. Um, they can actually take a copy of everything we do. And again, it's everything, soup to nuts. They can take a copy and fork our entire project out from under us. And if they're right, we lose, right? So we are incented to treat our community well, just as we want all our community members to treat each other well, right? So it's a, it's a nice check and balance. So those building blocks can become something new. Now, Clint uh, Savage is up here in front. Raise your hand, Clint. Clint did a, uh, a little uh, a piece earlier on, on remixing Fedora, and that's, uh, you know, that's one piece of this all free and open source uh, idea that's very powerful. You can put right in people's hands. They can remix our distribution in many different ways. So that's one way that, uh, that, that, that redistributa redistributability helps. But it also means that it helps contributors be motivated because they know that what they're doing is not going to disappear into a black hole somewhere, right? It's going to go out into the world and help people. Anybody can grab a copy of it. If I'm working on a project in our, in our hosted system, anybody can grab that. They can, they can copy it. They can contribute to it. They can redistribute it. They can sell it if they want. They can fork it. If, if, you know, if they're going to do a better job, I'd say have at it. Right? That's what open source is about, is all that freedom. Right? There's nothing locked away in a closet. Um, it also means that the people who are working in the project are able to build a transparent resume uh, that they can show to anybody. Right? And in these kind of times, it's good to have that sort of thing on your resume, to be able to show people the kind of work of which you're capable. Right? So you can do that transparently in Fedora. And what that means is the, the, return, yeah, the return on investment for uh, contributors is really great. And so what happens is you get these immensely overstaffed booths at shows like this. Uh, and you get, you know, all sorts of people. You get, you, you know, you get fat people. You get skinny people. You know, people with no hair. People with too much hair. <laughs> all sorts of people. Um, and and they, feel, they feel an affinity for Fedora. They, they, they're invested in it because they know that what they're building is going to be 100% out there to help other people grow as well. So I'll tell you some examples of how we engage contributors. And you know, maybe there's some lessons in here for, for your team, for your project, maybe for your company. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in open source, uh, you know, again, feel free to take. That's, that's what we do. Um, so by encouraging contributors, I, I don't mean imposing on contributors, right? They're able to find their own way. But sometimes people come into, to, uh, into a community of contributors, and they want so badly to put in time, and they're not exactly sure how. So some of the things that we found work really well are simple organizational rules that really work well for any kind of process that you're doing. Does anybody here read... Uh, you know any number of uh, any number of the uh, common self help books things like you know the get getting things done and stuff like that yeah i mean there 's shelves full of this stuff right and and hidden deep in there is like the secret code to unlock the entire universe, but you can 't find it in just one book you have to read like twenty five of them and ferret it out for yourself i i haven 't i 'm only at book twenty three so um, I'm, that's I, I have to still stick around and do these speeches because when I read book twenty five that 's where you know this hollow shell falls off and I'm going to float away or something. I don't, I'll be in the next plane of existence doing speeches again, probably. And those people will look just as unhappy as you do. So what are some of the things that, that, uh, that, that we believe help encourage contributors? And again, not imposing, but how do we encourage them, the people who are coming in and want so badly to give and need some directions? Well, one of the things you can do is set measurable milestones, right? Set Set milestones that people can achieve. And, and that means you know, not just one person at the top of the project, but a team leader can actually give that person a chunk of work to do. One of the things that I've asked our teams to do in Fedora at, in the wake of Fedora 11 release for the first time, and uh, you know, I think this is on everybody's mind, but I wanted to make it into more of, a, a more of a big deal, more of a process. I wanted to ask our team leaders, what is one achievable goal for your team for the next few months? What do you think you could do before we start heating up the, you know, our, our development cycle to the point where we're going to be concentrating on, on really beating bugs out and we all get involved in, in sort of stabilizing that release? What can we do in the, in the, in the time 
between the release of Fedora 11 and the time that we start doing that work for Fedora 12. And there's a couple months of, of uh, really good time to be had there where you're not under a lot of pressure for that release. So what can we do in that time that would be interesting? And more importantly, what that goal must be something that's oriented around making your team's experience in the Fedora project better. What's going to improve life for them? What's a goal that we can achieve to improve life? And, and you know, for example, uh, you know, one idea would be uh, you know, switching, switching source code uh, control systems, right? That might be one way that you could, you could improve life for contributors, right? Certainly there's going to be a you know, bunch of people are going to get in a room and they're going to fight it out and figure out which one's going to be best for them and it'll be all you know, dirty and, uh, and, and muddy and people throwing rocks at each other. But eventually at the end, they come out with a good answer and everybody says, all right, good fight, let's go home and, and all work together now. Um, so that's an example of, a, of an achievable goal. So the next thing you have to figure out is what is the next action required to get there? So if you're giving this goal to somebody, you want to, uh, you want to give them an explicit direction to go in, right? Telling somebody, "Hey, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Um, you know, read all our documentation and uh, you know, join like eight lists and uh, you know, do, do this and do that. And uh, yeah, hey, you'll be a contributor, right? That, that's that's not a lot of direction to give people. Um, really, what they need are achievable goals. And when you give them a next action to take, which is find person X on IRC and ask him how you would carry out this task, right? That's something measurable, it's small, it's bite-sized, and somebody can do it in an evening. They just wait for person X to be around and talk to him and start engaging. And that means that they've now made a social contact, which, you know, again, strengthens these bonds and the affinity that people have for, for the project. So I like to think of the next action, if, if you can wrap a social action into it, that's always best. All right. This is also important. If you're dealing with a team, now, okay, getting away from new contributors, but if you've got an established team of people, uh, when, you're, when you figure out these goals and these next actions, something that's very important is figuring out who's going to do it. And what I've found is very common in open source communities all over, all over the world, I, and I don't think this is specific to Fedora at all, we have a tendency to overuse the word we, right? And we say we when we, when we mean we should do this, and what we really mean is someone should do this, but not me. <laughs> Except when I say it, it's true, because really, I'm not smart enough to do it, so I, it's better that I don't do it, really. Um, but someone should, really, honestly. Someone else should give this speech, as a matter of fact. <laughs> we should give this speech. No, um, no we, is, we is a very easy word to fall back on. Right? And we is very inclusive. It's a wonderful word, and it means a lot of things to a lot of people. Unfortunately, one of the things it means is a lack of accountability. Right? So if you keep saying we up until the point that your, your, your time to complete the, whatever this, this task is is done, you arrive at the point and you go, oh my god, it didn't get done. Why is that? Well, because we didn't do it. So you all look over at we and say, we, you are not coming back to this project. We do not trust you anymore. I mean, you can't do that. So. Who is going to do it? You need to find accountability. Um, and it needs to be done in a way that is authentic. It needs to be in, in terms of, uh, of friendship and uh, not just responsibility, but in terms of uh, affinity for your fellow human being, right? You're, you're talking to somebody who has come in because they want to give, and you don't want to smack them down with a task and say, you're going to do this, and by God, you better get it done. That's not the right way to approach it. What is the right way to approach it is to find people who are interested in a certain task or to find someone who hasn't raised their hand because they're afraid that they're going to step on somebody's toes, which is far more often the case. You say... So and so, you've been around for a couple weeks. Um, this particular task doesn't look really, it's not really difficult. There's only a couple steps required, and it would take about an hour of work. Is that something you feel that you're ready to do? Um, do you think like do you think you would need help to do it? We can get somebody to help you through it. Right? And those are all things that uh, that come along with this. So again, it's not an imposition, you're encouraging people. And I hit the I apparently hit the wrong key again. So we're gonna go through a bit of this. But let me go back and see if I can redo this better than I did before. Did I pass where I was? I think I passed. I was going to do it. Oh, there we go. The, the most important rule. Once you have teams that are doing this work, 
And once you've got these actions assigned, get out of the way. And this is something that Joe Brockmeyer Zonker, who spoke this morning, and I really see eye to eye on. You absolutely have to get out of the way of your contributors. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that in a second. But um, when you look at all of these, these uh, issues that I just talked about, it seems like it's sort of regimented, right? It seems like it's some sort of attack plan to get your community mobilized. And if you can only give the right people the right orders at the right time, everything will magically come together. It's not really, it doesn't really work that way, right? It still has a very organic feel to it. But the point of, of, of having these, uh, these, um, uh, these little tidbits in your mind is that uh, it's going to bring you to a place where you've actually accomplished something when you look back on that, on that time frame. And we found that when you look back on tasks that have been completed in this way, it really makes you motivated because you look back and think, wow, in two, in two months, look what we did. We achieved this. We rolled out a new content management system. We have a new source control repo. We just redid the way that we, uh, that we roll our, uh, our, uh, rapid, uh, our rapid release development cycle. We've changed the way that we tag packages, right? There are a million things that you can look back on and say, we did this, right? And that's the right place for the word we, right? So people take accountability, and in a good community, they share the, uh, they share the, um, uh, the, the good things that come out of that. They, they, they share the accolades, right? So this is the right place for we. All right, so um, I also think that if you want to engage contributors, you have to have a long-term strategy for growing participation. And it has to be more than just you know, finding people on the street and recruiting them. It's got to be, you, know, there ha there, you have to actually engineer solutions that grow participation. This is something that's a very big deal uh, uh, for us in Fedora. And what that means, uh, you know, again, if you, if you want to do things the right way, in my opinion, you have to avoid the temptation of Band-Aids. Right? It's very easy to say, well, okay, I know, this needs, I know what we really need to get done here is we need to have some facility for people to contribute and help and collaborate in doing this task. But it really would be easier if I just go do it myself right now. If I just get this task done, it, yeah, it's going to take me a few hours all by myself or it's going to take me a few days, but it'll be done. Right? But if you keep doing that, you have limited the amount of, uh, you've, I'm sorry, you've limited the ability for your contributors to help. You've limited the way that they can collaborate with you. Um, and it's, you know, it's very tempting to do that, especially if you feel like you have that skill. But the point for any, um, any community leader is to uh, teach others and build solutions that help them succeed, not do all the work yourself. And you know, I talked about Mike McGrath in the infrastructure team earlier, and that's a, a great uh, that's a great example of somebody who has built up a team basically from scratch by teaching others to do so that he doesn't have to answer every page because we have people covering our infrastructure who live in London and who live in Paris and who live in Stuttgart and who live in India and who live in Australia, right? So we have this kind of follow the sun infrastructure team so one person doesn't have to carry all that load or two people or three people. It's you know, quite a lot more. So Band-Aids are tempting, but what you gain from teaching others is immeasurably better. All right, then you have my, my, new, uh, my new mantra, the hit by a bus mantra. This, if you're going to encourage your contributors, the one question you need to ask yourself every day is what would happen today, what would happen to this team, this project, this code, if I got hit by a bus? Now some people think that's really harsh. When I, when I came up with the hit by a bus analogy, struck people that that just was a little close to home because you actually could get hit by a bus. And that seemed just, uh, you know, with the worries about insurance costs and things like that, people didn't like that. So one of our other community members came out, well, what if you won the lottery? <laughs> what if you won the lottery, okay? Well, I don't know if that's really apt because I'll tell you, um, honest, in, in all honesty and, you know, Cross my heart, hope to die, I swear on the you know, lives of my two children. If I won the lottery tomorrow, if I won Powerball, like $250 million, I might quit my project leader job, but I would be involved in Fedora the rest of my life, all the time. Right? I'd still do it full time for fun, because that's how great it is. Right? So won the lottery doesn't really work, because I think really a lot of people would stay around. So we came up with a good halfway point, which I think works, which is eaten by raptors. <laughs> So 
Obviously, no one, I think, out there is truly worried they're going to be eaten by a raptor. If you are, I please lay off the sauce. That's everything, okay? Um, at least after tonight, right after the after party. Um, so eaten by raptors, not likely to happen, but the question you're really asking is, what would happen to my team or my project if, you know, if I left tomorrow? Do they have the tools that they need to succeed? If they don't, you are in the way, okay? It's as simple as that, right? If they don't have the tools they need to succeed, you're in the way, and you need to get out of the way. Remember that rule earlier? So that means you want to spend more time building things that scale out and allow more collaboration. All right. Whoops, I've done it again. I, I, I keep hitting the, the any key, apparently. All right. Okay, well, we can go on to getting out of the way since, since we're on that subject anyway. Um, I'm going to have to disable that little touchpad thing because it's really dangerous, apparently. The mission for any team leader is to grow their team, and I think... Uh, ultimately, the mission for somebody who is a, a project lead or, or in, a, in a pretty high position of project is to make themselves as obsolete as possible, right? There are times where a project leader is needed. I don't foresee a time when Fedora would, ne would not have a project leader because there are too many benefits that the project gets out of it. And there are also benefits that Red Hat gets out of it and, of course, is the main sponsor. We want to make sure that Fedora stays healthy and is doing what it needs to do to succeed. So I feel like we'll always have somebody where the buck, you know, the buck is going to stop here. And I actually, if I can get out of my pants or my fat posterior, I actually have the Fedora buck right here. This was given to me by Max Spivak, and it sits in my wallet, and that's what reminds me every day that this is where the buck stops. If something happens in Fedora, uh, this is the one throat to choke right here. But aside from that, you want to get out of the way as much as possible. And I'll give you an example of... Uh, uh, of how getting out of the way is important. Um, uh, we have, we have a, a lot of Fedora ambassadors that made it down uh, to, this, uh, to this event. Um, David, David Nally is one of our, uh, one of our great ambassadors, uh, Clint Savage, and I think we've got a couple. Of, are there any other Fedora ambassadors back there? I think Ben's back there, right? Raise your hand or stand up or something, right? Mr. de Koenigsberg, very good. So, we have, so we've got a, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we have, uh, we have ambassadors that uh, are, are the people who sort of do the, the groundwork, right? They are the people who talk to people. They press the flesh where we can't, right? We can't be everywhere. So the ambassadors are out there because they believe in what Fedora is doing, and they want people to know about it, and they want them to know, uh, you know how, this, how this project works and, and you know, what makes it distinctive and what makes it cool. And what makes it the kind of place where somebody would, you know, win a Powerball and still stick around for, you know, 10 or 12 hours a day? You know, God, well, other than insanity, of course. Um, so we, had, we have consistently had problems with, um, with ambassadors uh, 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 with ambassadors not being able to achieve uh, certain goals, right? They, they wanted to have media for shows, to be able to give it out to people. And um, we at Red Hat were always in the way of that. We ordered them from a, you know, we had to go order from a printing company, and we had to do all these deals and purchase orders and all this crazy stuff. And uh, eventually what we would get is, you know, a bunch of media for, for example, like for our Fedora 9 release, as you guys remember, was, you know, not really that well made. I mean, the covers were kind of off kilter and didn't look real good. It wasn't very professional. And we paid, I think, like a buck seventy or something for each piece of media. It was insane. Um, we asked our ambassadors to help. Please, please help us because we obviously do not know what we're doing. And these guys turned around. They found not only did they they find a place that produced the media well, they set up an entire shipping system for around the country. So if anybody in our project needs media, they can basically put a ticket in with uh, with one of the ambassadors issue ticket systems and say, "Hey, I need a uh, hundred live CDs. Can you send them in a, by uh, the Tuesday after next?" Sure, no problem. And they get it there. And we just simply handle the shipping bills. They just come to us, and we just we just pay them. And uh, that, that costs us, I, th I think, something like 65 cents a piece of media now. So basically, you know, by getting out of the way, we dropped 60-some percent of, of our cost. Um, it, it, I mean, it's just one example of how you need to let your community do what they do best, which is everything that you can't do. All right. Um, finally, uh, I guess I want to, as, as far as uh, engaging contributors, I want to leave you with another thought, which is a growing community is essentially like compounding interest. Um, it's something that it takes willpower. You have to do it regularly. Uh, you need to be devoted to it every day. And it's never too late to start, but the earlier you start, the better. 
right? And the same things go for your savings account as they do for growing your community. All right, what time are we at now? When did we start? About 20 after? Okay. All right, I'm going to take about five minutes here, I'm just, and I'm going to wrap up real quick. So those of you who are snoozing in the back, just continue snoring. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the four foundations. What, what came out of this contributor focus for us was a way to talk about our core values in our project uh, as, as something very separate and very distinct from Red Hat. You know, and we're, we in the project are very grateful for Red Hat for what they do for us. They provide money, they provide people support, they provide bandwidth, uh, they provide uh, you know, uh, press relations. There's, there's innumerable things that they do for us. Um, they free legal counsel, uh, all sorts of great stuff. But we really are separate and distinct from them in some, in some uh, important ways. And we wanted to have a way of, of stating that. We wanted to have a way of saying what we, Fedora, stood for and what we agree on. And so we came up with these four foundations, and, uh, and, and eventually somebody created some, some really nice art to show these things off. So um, in turn, you know, we, 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 we talk about these four foundations. Uh, the first one is freedom. And I talked a little about that earlier, 100% free and open source software. That is all we do. Everything we build and everything we make in Fedora, uh, whether it's content or whether it's uh, you know, web code or whether it's our build system, anything that we do, it's 100% free and open source, and it's all available to anybody to use, copy for whatever purpose they want. Um, the other thing we believe is that we do not believe in restricting users, and that includes their ability to redistribute, and that's a very fine point, right? We do not believe in restricting users' right to go get solutions that may be legally encumbered for some Fedora people, right? We believe in making it possible for them to do that, but we do not include those solutions, things like, uh, oh, the dreaded MP3, right, which has, it's legally encumbered by patents in uh, some parts of the world, including the United States. Um, there are many other pieces of code that have similar types of encumbrances. It's a it's a dirty problem, and uh, we believe in fighting that to the bitter, uh, deathly end. But things are as they are right now, and we want Fedora to continue despite that. We would rather not be sued into the ground by somebody who's a, a patent holder. Um, you know, it'd be nice for Daddy Red Hat to uh, to defend us, but in in the end, really, we'd like to just kind of avoid that. Spend more time thinking about actually doing real open source work. So we do not, what we try and do is, is uh, not restrict users' ability to redistribute by not putting those kinds of things in Fedora because we want to be 100% free and redistributable for everyone, which means if you take Fedora and remix it, whatever you get, we want you to be able to distribute to everybody without worrying about legal restrictions. And that's not true of a lot of the encumbered stuff out there, right? You can install it on your machine, but if you mix something with it and put it all together in one thing and hand it out, it may not be redistributable depending on where you live. That's a, that's a very tough situation to be in if you're a, uh, if you're a free software advocate. Um, so we do not believe in cutting corners when it comes to that. And, and uh, you know, in my, my personal viewpoint, the best reason for, uh, for being 100% free and open source is that there is no point in talking the talk if you do not walk the walk, right? And that's why everything that we do from soup to nuts is 100% open source, right? And, and I think that sends a message also that, you know, we get to send a message that it is good enough for you, and that means it is good enough for us too, right? If we're going to tell you that free software is wonderful, we're going to show you it's wonderful, and we're going to build these things with it, and that's how you're going to know. All right, friends, I think everybody has something to give. We have many teams in Fedora, art and design, translation, people who are doing documentation, uh, uh, people who just simply spend time in an IRC room explaining things to other people politely. Um, if you would like to become a part, it's a very, if you'd like to become a part of Fedora, it's very easy to do that. You simply go to join.fedoraproject.org, sign up for an account, and you, have, you can click a little, yes, I agree to the contributor license agreement, which basically means that you've, you are telling us that what you're going to give us is free, and we're free to re redistribute it. Not only that, but we are, you are allowing us to keep it free for other people without giving up your copyright. Okay? So right now... Because we've made that, that system so easy in the last year and a half, our number of account holders has skyrocketed. Uh, not all of those people become contributors. Uh, we've, we've, we're at about 30,000 account holders now, uh, but not all of those people are contributors. About 14,000 of them have signed our contributor license agreement. 
Um, do I think all 14,000 of them are in Fedora every day doing tasks? No, I don't. But if you look at that pyramid, I'm pretty sure about 2,000 are, and that's a lot of people. That's a, that's a full-sized company. Red Hat has, I think, what, 2,900 and some employees? 3,000? Do we have 3,000? Okay. So we are about the size that Red Hat was you know, two or three years ago, right? That's, that's, a, that's, a, sizable, that's a sizable concern. Um, out, of this, out of this friendship that binds us together, the common purpose, we sometimes have disagreements about how things should be done. But what we always do is we discuss it, right? We talk about it with each other, and ultimately we reach some kind of consensus, right? And that consensus may be that the people who are going to do the work are going to make the call, right? If we, if we can't reach some sort of consensus, the people who are going to put in the elbow grease get a say how it's done, right? And that's how you keep from stagnating. Everything cannot be a vote, right? Every, turning everything into a vote is a quagmire. Somebody at some point has to step up and lead. So as friends, we realize that, and we, commit, we have a commitment to each other not to stand in the way of consensus uh, for trivial things. Okay, and that's how we can keep that. That's how we can keep that movement going. Um, as far as features, uh, you know, I don't think anybody can argue with the the technical features that come out of the Fedora project. A lot of our contributors are involved uh, very deeply in the communities that power everything you guys are running in free software. Right, there are Fedora contributors out there working in you know things like the kernel and x.org, which powers your GUI, and glibc, which you know basically everything uses, uh, you know, the, sh uh, the shells and utilities that you use at a command line or that you build GUIs around. A lot of those things are, uh, you know, we have Fedora contributors who are involved very heavily in those upstream communities. As a matter of fact, I actually just found out the other day that we have, uh, out, of our, out of our community of contributors, we have, I believe, 19 people who were invited to the plumbers conference to speak uh, there. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's quite a bit more than the, the next nearest uh, the next nearest bunch. So it's something that, uh, you know, I think we're, we're very proud of the technical excellence part. Um, and what powers that, again, is that upstream collaboration, the fact that we work directly with all these upstreams and that we, uh, you know, again, we try not to hoard code or hoard patches. We try and work directly with, uh, with other communities. Our feature process allows our contributors to enter a feature. If anybody has ownership of some code and they feel like it's worthy of going into a release, they can become a part of our feature process, and that means we'll talk about it for the next release and, and uh, draw a lot of attention, draw people to help make it better, file bugs, triage those bugs, and so on. So Red Hat has actually hired people on the basis of work done in Fedora um, for those reasons, and uh, you know anybody else could too. So again, you know, this is an open and transparent project, and it's a great way to build a, uh, build a resume. Um, and lastly, first, um, we believe in innovation. We're very eager in Fedora to do the heavy lifting, right? Um, doing heavy lifting is not always fun, but it's almost always rewarding. Um, our rapid release cycle means that we can balance that innovation with putting something in front of people that is incredibly useful, shows off some of the best code that runs today. Um, and Red Hat participates in this because they get something out of it too. Essentially, they can use Fedora as their R&D lab for their future product line, right? Anyone else can too. That's the great thing about it, right? Red Hat puts in a lot of resources, but anyone else can as well. If you've got something that you'd like to see million, in front of potentially millions of people, you can do the same thing. So that is basically our, our four foundations. And um, there are two silent Fs that you don't see on here. Um, one of them is fail. Right, and we, we try not to make that part of this picture if we can avoid it, right? But I also believe in something that Zonker said. He and I, I see eye to eye on a, on a few things. And one of the things he said this morning was, you know, just get up and do something, right? Do something, even if it's wrong. And we definitely believe in that too. We believe uh, that failure is necessary to grow, and it's okay to fail. It's what you do with the failure that defines the project. It's what you do with the failure that defines you, okay? And, uh, you know, so, so something that, that Greg de Koenigsberg is back there is, you know, one of my, one of my good buddies and, uh, and mentors when I started in Fedora many years ago um, and uh, has shown a lot of, of, of uh, trust and, uh, uh, you know, and friendship to me. So he, he said something one, uh, once that, that I, I never forget, which is the, 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 where the sixth uh, F, the, the silent uh, foundation comes out, which is faster. Fail, 
faster. And that's what we believe in in Fedora. Fail quickly, get over it, pick yourself up, and try again. And fail again if you have to, and keep doing it as fast as you can. Right? And that's how you grow. And that's all I have to say. So I hope you take some of these lessons and can grow some communities of your own out there. Um, take them and use them with your teams. And uh, I hope that you have really enjoyed this incredible inaugural Southeast Linux Fest. I'm so happy to be here, and I, I would love to come back next year. So we'll meet up then and see how you guys did. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, share alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.